There are a considerable number of ancient anomalies located within Egypt. These ancient feats of engineering litter sites and the quarries the stones were sourced and shaped at. And although many of you would have heard of Aswan Quarry, Elephantine may be a less familiar location to you, and for good reason. Not only are the pyramids one of the most perplexing, near perfectly constructed, and as yet unexplained ancient architectural accomplishments on Earth, but how an ancient civilization, supposedly placed within permitted known archaeological history, accomplished such a feat, or indeed why? What was their original purpose? Academic contradiction, a severe lack of anomalous artifacts explored, never mentioned or somehow conveniently go unnoticed. However, in the real world, beyond the boundaries of the fenced or so-called schools of education, thanks to our own work and the presentation of such a volume of inexplicable events artifacts, ruins or megaliths, along with many others allied within similar fields, independently funded researchers, investigative agents, and many more sometimes even noticed first by a viewer credited with its rediscovery within our coverage. Thanks to all this movement working to expose such enigmas, has meant that not only are these incredible characteristics now being documented, mentioned, popularized, photographed and studied more and more each day, now being recognized by more and more critically thinking individuals individually finding evidence of lost technologies that had until then either been undiscovered or deliberately overlooked by the funded academic. The vast catalog of unexplained architecture, again growing by the day, but also the often accompanying curious stone cuts, scars and striations, all clearly left by high-speed disc-cutting machine, a signature tool mark, identical to that which is left by modern-day power tools, along with the still absent demonstration of the methods used to construct the pyramids leads anyone to this ongoing and seemingly most controversial of arguments regarding the origins of the ruins found across Egypt. The Colossus of Memnon, each one weighing far over 1,000 tons, would sing every morning an amazing ability we have covered in a previous video, a curious characteristic reported all the way up until the Roman era. We also covered the thick layer of sea salt once found coating the pyramid's ground and underground caverns, along with a water line reported at around 40 meters up their sides, still visible during the Spanish invasion. This clearly suggests that the pyramids and their accompanying sphinx are in reality so old they even had once been submerged in ocean waters. An ancient ocean which over the eons has shifted leaving behind sediment in the form of the desert sands. There are many enormous ancient megalithic stones hidden in and around the three great pyramids of Egypt. Not only are there enormous ancient stones virtually hidden in plain sight, thus although walked across, largely overlooked, hardly ever mentioned, and never explained in regards to their transport and placement as modern academia will never be able to provide a logical, sound explanation for these feats. The casing stones, an area of interest we have explored and documented, not only displayed vastly different ages, but also construction methods and types of stones sourced and used. Ultimately, undeniable proof of efforts to preserve the outer stones of these incredible ancient pyramids later on within their history. Signature tool marks, unique features such as protuberances, masonry shapes, polygonal stonewalling, and many other features which we have discovered during our explanations into the relics of lost antiquity. Yet Egypt's most intriguing assets, and we feel the most baffling relics which all alternative historians should have within their debacle armory, are undoubtedly to be found within the once abruptly abandoned quarries. The unfinished obelisk found at Aswan, being one such relic, the most well-known of these incredible stones by a long way, not only is the obelisk over 1,000 tons, but also due to the identifiable scoop-like tool marks left upon its granite sides, a signature scarring 
which again, we have so far found, explored and shared this marking at many other ancient sites around the world. Who were the original builders of the Great Pyramids? Were they the same group that quarries Aswan? What tools did these people use to cut many of the relics still left at the Elephantine Island Quarry? How can anyone gaze upon such precision stonework and not ponder how did he accomplish such an incredible finish with such hard stone, with such soft chisels and those made of copper? Not only do we find the currently attested tale of events vastly incomplete, but in many ways virtually impossible. Predictably, we are often confronted with an illogical explanation as to the origins of many unexplainable ruins. Yet Egypt, in particular Aswan and Giza, were clearly the work of a group capable of working and building with 1,000 ton plus stones. With columns of pink Aswan granite, weighing over 14 tons each, over 10,000 kilometers to Baalbek. Is this connection mere coincidence? Or are the builders of said sites connected somehow? Possibly one and the same? Questions we get closer to answering every day. We find it highly compelling. We often cover ancient yet seemingly advanced ruins, during our presentation of these evidential arguments, often suggesting at least one antediluvian civilization lived before the last ice age and had actually accomplished a level of societal sophistication which allowed them to master, among many other things, the art and gargantuan responsibility of stonemasonry, often creating ancient stone structures so plumb they can even rival modern master masons of the day in their astonishing skill, accuracy, and thus by default high precision unquestionably achieved with highly advanced technologies now lost to the sands of time. But I digress. For there are many other avenues of investigative research, supporting evidence of past highly advanced human activities, uparts, also known as out-of-place artifacts, is now, thanks to modern technology and social medias, a literal treasure trove of ancient artifacts that in one respect or another utterly support the channel's hypothesis. However, if ever academically acknowledged for what these relics truly are, it would topple their tower of cards, for all modern academia has achieved by doubling down and keeping a profitable yet so strongly disprovable chronology on life support protected as a status quo, unwittingly creating a castle upon the proverbial sands of public opinion. Without the influential grip that institutes possess, and now that academia has doubled, tripled, quadrupled down on already pushed popular and thus profitable modern paradigm, yet due to individuals such as Mystery History and many others like him, whose collaborative work over many years has not only contradicted said tale of events countless times, but due to said argument becoming more and more compelling, with every fine driving the nails deeper into the coffin of their theory, has, in return, forced academia and historians into a position of obvious, deliberate ignorance, denying a reality we simply wish to convey. We never intend to push a theory upon anyone. We attempt to explain the channel's opinion and importantly why any particular subject or place is not only unexplainable, but I had to come to my own particular conclusions regarding said subject. Yet worryingly, this next approach is not one pursued by academia, firstly to convey all the evidence found at a site, not just that which supports my theory, even that which cannot be explained, but also to never state my presumption built over many years of research as an undeniable fact. I set out to provide uncensored, unbiased, impartial truths, often Earth's advanced ancient megaliths, tool marks, stone cuts, artifacts, and many other areas one can investigate, often accompanied by an array of photographic evidence supporting our theory. And the more academics continue this denial of said evidence, they force themselves further and further down the proverbial plank of popularity. For if one bases one's premise upon a faulty foundation, then eventually it will collapse, becoming disproven beyond any reasonable doubt. 
and if it weren't for a greedy, power-hungry, controlling force still within academia, operating on our planet to this day, the long-attested timeline for man on Earth would have unraveled a long time ago. Not only ending said flows of cash, currently generated by said conspiracies and associated constructed theology, but additionally, and perhaps the defining motivation behind this mammoth task of not only funding academia and subsequently pushing said conspiracy, and the very costly operation it must be to preserve it, in addition to the tremendous efforts witnessed in regards to the timeline's protection. The Bering Strait, for example, not only lost a highly gifted, honest archaeologist her career, but due to it being crucial to mainstream theory, and due to its ability to disprove said theory, has been a location completely shut off from everyone, now guarded all year round with incredibly harsh penalties for trespassers. A move we find highly suspicious. Their loss of public trust, their authority over public opinion. The loyal flock of the illogical, however, due to these characters' positions and their ability to pump out books regurgitating this particular tale of historical origins, highly paid, so-called trusted academics, whose reputations rest upon this hoax, protect it at all costs. They must ignore that which doesn't fit, for due to their utter conviction in their own explanations, academics would ultimately experience irreparable damage to their particular institution's validity. Interestingly, an area that is rarely covered within this genre of historical study, which is somewhat surprising, is the curious and quietly studied evidences found upon a number of rare ancient remains that not only suggest that people were practicing surgery thousands of years ago, but also due to the surgical evidence left upon an Egyptian mummy is truly astonishing. Perhaps these practices were inspired by the death of King Tut, more popularly known as Tutankhamun, who died after complications derived from a broken leg. Yet such feats this particular procedure, for example, should have been far out of the technological capabilities of the Egyptians. We are so often introduced to at school and any other educational institute found to control mass opinion. Although some impressive wooden prosthetics have been found over the decades, some even dated to the Egyptian dynasties, to have actually operated on and successfully pinned and repaired a knee joint, is simply too far of an advanced surgical procedure for them to have known. Is it possible that the task was undertaken by a surgeon far more equipped than that of the currently academically claimed builders? Who in reality, we feel, were mere lodgers? How did this ancient people accomplish such impressive medical procedures? Is it possible that we are looking at a member of a far older, once highly capable lost civilization? We find many areas of ancient antiquity can still tell us some incredibly intriguing things regarding their age, our past, and perhaps one day ultimately expose who we are and where we came from. It is a pursuit of truth we will always find highly compelling. Professor Jaime gutierrez -Gent, a passionate collector of out-of-place artifacts, has accumulated a fascinating array of puzzling pieces. We have previously covered the work of Klaus Dona, who originally brought these to our attention. He is responsible for publicizing a lot of these fascinating objects, with our favorite being the Nomoli figurines, one of which dated at a minimum of 12,500 years, which was created containing a metallic ball of advanced metallurgy, unquestionably of a tremendous age, yet also of advanced origin. Yet I digress. Among Professor Gutierrez's collection is the infamous gene disc made of lidite and featuring the entire birth cycle of the human female, even depicting microscopic events such as cell division, along with a few other select species. How the creators acquired this impressive in-depth knowledge of biology remains a complete mystery. Furthermore, and equally as compelling, are the surgical instruments, also made from lidite, Yet carved with such precision, modern research has revealed not only that they are perfectly balanced, but that each fits perfectly within the human hand, some rivaling and in certain areas actually superior to modern technology, with them now being slowly adapted into modern medicine, 
particularly the birthing tools. This knife, for example. On the top of the handle, you have the mother's head and then the child's head, with the umbilical cord around the neck of the child ingeniously signifying what the tool be used for. With this piece, illustrating that it be used to aid the child in leaving the birth canal during complications. On the reverse of the instrument are two perfectly placed grooves for the thumb and finger, indicating that if used correctly, it will not allow the introduction of any unrequired force during procedures. This is incredibly an advance on modern medical instruments, as the tool has been found to actually be a safer option during labor. Along with these, he also has an array of other surgical instruments, ranging in delicacy and size, yet all made of lidite to a precision which still escapes our capabilities. So, who made these medical artifacts? Or indeed, the gene disk, along with the many other curious lidite artifacts within Professor Gutierrez Ancient's collection? Were they left by a lost, yet clearly advanced civilization? We find the possibility highly compelling. So that means this knife could have been used to cut the umbilical cord, saving the child's life. Or could it have been used for ceremonial sacrifices? <laughs> well, I guess we'll never know, will we? Hey, I made that last part up. Every now and again, you stumble across an artifact. An ancient relic so astonishing, with such an enigmatic history and indeed properties. Only the most reliable of sources will suffice in satisfying doubts regarding authenticity, which will inevitably surround such objects. Impossible artifacts are extremely hard for some to digest, especially those with careers built around a paradigm, which said objects suggest were constructed upon a lie. Sir David Brewster must have experienced this personally, yet regardless, he still courageously brought the object before the dragons, or more specifically, the American Journal of Science. Quote, I have to bring before the section an object so incredible, only the strongest evidence could render the statement at all probable. It is an authentic ancient rock crystal lens. End quote. Roughly translated, Sir David had put his neck on the line for the truth, a truth which speaks of ancient advanced technologies. Discovered amongst the ruins of the treasure house at Nineveh, it had lay, undoubtedly, for many centuries, possibly even millennia, within the ruins of this once magnificent city. Although many have attempted to discredit the lens as a mere ornament, Sir David Brewster has courageously fought on regardless, arguing against such claims by stating that the convex nature of the lens, along with mysterious ancient gases and liquids which were once encased within the lens, made it a once efficient optical magnifier. It still has the remnants of 12 cavities upon it, which once contained some form of liquid or gas. 10 had been opened through damage over the eons, yet remarkably, two were seemingly still intact. The surface of the remaining cavities, Sir David claimed, were speckled with amazingly iridescent spots, far more vivid than a peacock spots, known now as the Nimrod lens. Italian scientist Giovanni Pettinato of Rome proposed in Babylonian astronomy that the lens was used by the ancient Assyrians as part of their telescope, explaining their detailed knowledge of astronomy, in particular Saturn. The ancient Assyrians were able to see Saturn, believing it to be a god surrounded by a ring of serpents. The British Museum's curator proposed that the lens could have been used as a piece of inlay, perhaps for furniture, or for magnification purposes, such as starting fires. Yet no mention of the mysterious gaseous fluids which were said to have once filled the original relic. Unfortunately, we may never know what happened to the authentic liquid-filled original artifact, and although it is claimed that the Nimrod lens is on public display at the British Museum, it is rarely spotted. We find the claims made by Sir David Brewster to have been highly compelling, though unfortunately, they may never be taken further. In the Museum of the Unexplained in Reed Spring, Missouri, a rather peculiar artifact can be found. Known as the Bob White Artifact, Bob was driving with a friend down a Colorado highway one night in 1985, when they would both experience a close encounter. As the craft flew over Bob's head, according to Bob, 
it dropped him a gift, an object which has caused Bob numerous issues. Quote, I don't know about you, but as for me, every time I hear people from Skeptic Magazine lying through their teeth, it makes me sick. They say they have never seen any hard evidence of UFOs. This is only true because they refuse to look at this, a piece of a UFO. So the next time you see the Skeptic Magazine people on Larry King or some other TV program saying there is no physical evidence, you will know they are lying. I have challenged them to debate me, but they are afraid. So, Skeptic Magazine, you have been exposed for the fraud that you are. That was a statement made by Bob White in the late 90s. He further claimed that in 1996, he was flown to the classified Los Alamos National Laboratory for a detailed analysis of his evidence. White was told by senior staff that the object he recovered was indeed of extraterrestrial origin also confessing to have successfully collected another object similar to his before. Although the officials fervently denied these claims, in 2000, Bob managed to acquire U.S. Army documents dating from the 1940s titled UFOs in Denmark. In it were multiple images of an object nearly identical to the one he had. When Dr. Rudolf Olson of Carolina examined the artifact, he concluded, quote, to describe the Bob White object in the simplest possible way, I think you can say it is an agglomeration of rapidly cooled droplets or particles of an aluminum silicon alloy. With such an unusual structure, I can only speculate on how it was formed. It turns out that this artifact was free-formed, or more precisely, it was somehow cast in a zero-g environment without the use of a mold. It has been to over 15 labs and universities over the past 21 years, including Los Alamos, Sally, New Mexico, etc. If the artifact had been on a machine or a grinder of some sort, there would inevitably have been forensic evidence left upon the artifact. All we know is that it was in a molten state when ejected into a vacuum under extreme pressure within extremely cold conditions. Although Bob White's artifact rarely gains any attention anymore, it is clearly a most compelling piece of evidence in support of the possibility of alien visitation. <laughs>